Hey friends, a quick word before we get started. Last Friday, there was a fire at our podcast studio. We're still sorting out what's next for the space and where, but we will rebuild. If you'd like to help the project, buymeacoffee.com slash Daily Detroit. Thanks to the listeners so far, those who've chosen to be anonymous, and those like Latasha, Jordan, Jeff, and John, among others. I'll be sure to do a more complete thank you, but in the between time, it's been a great sign you want us to keep going, and so we will keep on a keeping on. Welcome to your Daily Detroit for Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. Today, we're talking about the legal marijuana business in Detroit and its future. The city has architected now two different ordinances to not only allow recreational marijuana as voters have clearly said they wanted, but to provide some sort of equity for residents and those impacted by the longtime prosecution of the war on drugs. But the suburbs have moved faster with these allowances, and the industry is getting established there. Well, there are many calls here that city-based businesses are now on the verge of closure, not to mention the uncertainty for new investors. To help sort it out, Politico's cannabis editor, Paul Demko, joins me to talk about his recent in-depth piece that helps shed a light nationally on what's happening. But also, equity in the cannabis industry has been elusive across the country, so maybe there's something we all can learn. Let's just jump into that conversation. Joining me on the line, Paul Demko, the cannabis editor at Politico, put together a great story, one that I think people locally should pay attention to. It's called The Unintended Consequence of Trying to Give Black Marijuana Entrepreneurs a Head Start. Uh, Paul, first, welcome to Daily Detroit. And secondly, why focus on Detroit with this, with Politico's lens? Oh, thanks so much for having me. Um, Detroit is is interesting. I've written about it in the past, and it's just been sort of a long saga um, of of frustration, I think it's it's fair to say, in trying to launch a recreational market. Um, but also, I mean, Detroit is is somewhat unique in being a city that is nearly 80% uh, black and the issues raised by marijuana le- legalization and who benefits from it are just more pronounced and more stark um, in Detroit than just about anywhere in the country, given the the, the, the racist history of, of marijuana enforcement in this country. Oh, oh, for sure. And and it's interesting in your piece to see the ties that you do make, even though Detroit is a bit unique, the ties you do make to stories around the nation that are fighting this issue or dealing with this issue of how to put equity into cannabis laws and these retailers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Detroit is a is somewhat extreme example of what we've seen all across the country where, you know, to, to I think, state and municipalities' credits, they, they, they have started to really focus on the, the issue of racial equity and try to take steps to address it and make sure that you know, people who were disproportionately impacted by by criminal enforcement are actually able to uh, reap some of the benefits of legalization. But those programs have just run into all kinds of, of problems. And, and, and the biggest one is exactly what you've seen in Detroit is lawsuits, litigation. There's a lot of money at stake. And when you try to write, um, write ordinances that uh, give certain people a, a leg up over others, uh, you run into thorny constitutional issues. And you see that happen again and again and again. You know, even if, if ordinances aren't necessarily struck down, they ha- it has the impact of just delaying, delaying, delaying. So like in Illinois, you have, um, you know, what was seen as one of the most aggressive laws in the country in terms of trying to create uh, an equitable market. And it's just been, it's just gotten, um, you know, stalled indefinitely um, in lawsuits and, and basically nobody's been able to get licenses and, uh, and it's just kind of been a mess. What's kind of the crux of the argument that's being made to stop these local ordinances and local regulations? I mean, it varies, but definitely, you know, one of the the common themes that you see is a, is an equal protection argument that basically you're treating, you know, people differently under the law 
for um, sort of, um, you know, for reasons that that are sort of arbitrary in the court's eyes, and therefore it's unconstitutional. So like in the specific example of Detroit, you had in the initial ordinance that the city passed, they had what they called Detroit legacy um, applicants who were, were going to get at least half of the recreational marijuana licenses. And that was, it was a complicated definition, but basically it was designed to benefit longtime Detroit residents. And, um, and, and the, a federal judge uh, about a year ago tossed that out and said, you know, the, the residency uh, requirements are unconstitutional and, and, and are, or it's almost certainly unconstitutional, he said, and, and stopped the licensing process from moving forward. So that's a common one that you see with municipal ordinances. Sometimes it's more um, that, you know, a lot of times cities will set up like scoring systems to determine who gets a license and, and you'll have people challenge the, the scoring systems as being sort of arbitrary and capricious, stuff like that. So it varies. But basically, the, I think what it basically comes down to is that you're treating uh, different groups of people differently under the law, and that can be constitutionally problematic. On the other hand, one can make a pretty strong argument that people of color, black people, et cetera, have basically been screwed over by the system for many, many years. And there is so much data to show the difference in prosecutions between white people and black people and people of color when it comes to marijuana, marijuana usage, marijuana selling, all that stuff. And it, to I think some people, especially people I talk to here in Detroit, it feels very frustrating to get all do all this work, to put together something like this, to try to write something that was unjust and then have kind of court decisions be like, no, we're going to, we're, we're not going to even deal with that. It, I, I, I get that frustration. I mean, you're dealing with a situation that I, I don't think you could come up with anything uh, in recent history. That's a more stark example of racist enforcement policy. I mean, we've had two studies almost a decade apart by the ACLU that found that black people are almost four times as likely as white people to arrest, be arrested for marijuana possession, even though both groups use the drug at roughly equal rates. Um, so that's just incredibly stark. And then the courts, and then the courts to say, you know, we have to be a colorblind <laughs> society. And and uh, when that clearly hasn't been the case, I, I, I get why that would be uh, incredibly frustrating to people. What are some of the ways that you've seen people make some progress? Are there options that you've seen out there that people are taking or paths to kind of open these doors? Or is this a wall? Right. I mean, I talked to a couple people who know more about this than I do um, that I quoted in my piece. So I'll reference them. One is um, Amber Littlejohn, who's the executive director of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. And the other is Shaleen Title, who used to be a cannabis commissioner in Massachusetts, um, but has just been very active in these discussions. And what they both said is that, you know, low barriers to involvement in the industry are one thing that could help. Um, so that, you know, like in Oklahoma, for example, there's only a $2,500 licensing fee. Anybody can become a cultivator, a dispensary owner, or a processor or whatever for $2,500. So, you know, that doesn't benefit any one certain group of people, but it sort of makes it, it makes the barriers to access much lower. But then on top of that, Shaleen Title, you know, suggested that on top of making barriers to entry low and not having restrictions on licenses, you could also, you know, set aside a pot of money that would be available, you know, or some kind of benefits that would be available to folks who have been disproportionately impacted by criminal enforcement so that they might be able to tap into those funds to, you know, help pay for, it's an it's a expensive business to get into, you know, so help pay for your capital costs or, or what have you and give people a leg up that way rather than 
trying to sort of game the licensing system. Um, instead of that, provide sort of financial incentives that would help people, uh, you, you know, succeed in the market when they have access to it. So I think, you know, we don't have real good examples. There's no, there's no, there's no example. I don't think we can really point to at this point in time. That's been a big success. Uh, but it, we are still sort of early days in, the, in this discussion. If you look at, you know, the first states that had full legalization, Colorado and, and Washington, they didn't really do anything. They didn't really do anything to address racial equity. Um, and, and, and now you've seen as, as more legislatures have passed legislation like Illinois and New York and New Jersey, you're seeing more aggressive efforts, but those are really just getting off the ground. So, you know, I think it'll take time to see if we come up with a, a, a model for, for succeeding here. Well, I don't know if you know about this, but in Detroit, the foundation community has been a huge part in the transformation in paying for projects. And in my mind, I think about, you know, of course, the city has limited dollars and limited funds. And one could argue it makes it more difficult if the city is the one handing out those dollars legally. I think it could be an interesting thing to say, OK, the foundation community or different groups say, OK, if you're a Detroit resident or fit these different criteria, here are pots of money to help you get started and maybe like an end around or something like that. I don't know if there's any other places that that have those kinds of things, but I'm just thinking off the top of my head. If you can't go one way, how do you get through another way? Right, right. I mean, that's interesting. I think the prickly thing you're going to get into there is. The, the the crazy weirdness of this issue in this industry is, you know, the disconnect between state and federal policy. I mean, the, the federal government still says marijuana is a highly dangerous um, drug with no therapeutic uses. So I would think if you're a foundation who relies on a tax exemption from the federal government, right, right, you might be uh, <laughs> you might be hesitant to, to to go down that that path. I think the other challenge you're going to see in Detroit is like, you know, as I try to make clear my piece, you know, the, the industry is is all around Detroit now. Mm -hmm. And and these businesses are just going to get more and more entrenched, right? People are going to, you know, find their shops that they want to go to, find their, their strands of, of marijuana that they want to use. Um, and, and, and it's going to be tougher and tougher, you know, pleasantries in, in Hamtramck or you know, whatever the shops are in Ferndale or what have you. So it does start to seem like time is of the essence here if, if folks want to ever be able to compete. For sure. And I think it's uh, an opportunity where the city's missing out on revenue and, and tax dollars. And because that's the other component of this is that these these smaller cities are reaping large benefits from it. I have toured a number of these facilities and I swear, like a bunch of them, they look like Apple stores in the suburbs. Like it's a whole nother yep. level where it's not just like a, a corner weed shop. It like turns into this retail experience. Like I walked into this place in Hazel Park, totally unassuming kind of, you know, building on a, on not a secondary, basically a secondary commercial road. And you walk in and mm -hmm. you swear that Steve Jobs designed the place or, you know, there's all this other stuff and. It, I can see where there's going to be people who just say, I can't even do that. Like and I, I saw in your piece, people frustrated yeah. that they, they couldn't compete. Yeah. And I, I don't think that sends a good sign to the nation about doing business in the city of Detroit either. And it makes you wonder, you know, how many people on council and you mentioned this in your piece. I want to talk about for a quick second, how many people on council or whatever actually want to do it because there's a, although it passed overwhelmingly with the ballot, there are lots of strong right. and powerful groups in the city of Detroit that do not want this to happen. They just don't like to talk about it publicly. Mm. I mean, there's definitely people I talked to and I, I, I quoted them. One of them being, you know, Scott Roberts, a, a lawyer who is suing the city right now saying, you know, Detroit is, is acting in a way that suggests they don't actually want recreational shops. Now, I mean, I, I, I can't be that cynical. I have to take, uh, Councilman Tate at his word. He's been working on this for a long time. Gen genuinely wants to get get it done. Oh, I was going to say, I believe Tate does. I've talked to him myself over the years. Like, I believe this is something he wants, mm -hmm. but I wonder if other council members don't have the same conviction. 
Yeah, I don't know. My my efforts to talk to other folks were were frustrating, to tell you the truth. Um, like I had reached out to um, Coleman Young because I thought he had some interesting things to say when they were debating the ordinance and was kind of frustrated with it. But I wasn't clear exactly what his criticisms were. I was a little so I had hoped to talk to him. And then there's one person I'm blanking on her name who voted against the ordinance as well. But I didn't have any luck connecting with the, those folks while uh, while I was reporting the story. Unfortunately, that that's a real shame. So, are there any takeaways that you've got, whether it's local or, or national, or like the impact of this thing and where it might go in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Detroit you know, should be, deserves credit for, for, for trying to be deliberate about this and trying to get it right. Um, and trying to make sure that, that, that folks in the city, particularly the, you know, very large black population are able to reap the benefits of this. And it's not simply a bunch of white owned companies from out of town, um, benefiting from this market. But the realities are that Detroit's being just left behind. I mean, I quoted, quoted Kimberly Scott right at the end of my piece saying, you know, basically, you know, nobody's waiting on Detroit. Um, and she was a little miffed at me um, for quoting her saying that. But I, I really, I really do think that's kind of the takeaway here. The reality is that this, while Detroit goes through these legal battles and fights this fight, um, just sort of being left behind from, you know, what's a, a $1.8 billion industry now in Michigan. And I think that's a shame. And it's particularly a shame for folks who are trying to make a go of it in, in Detroit with medical businesses. And, and, and there's just no way they can compete with the, the stores and the delivery services that are all around them that can sell to anyone who's 21 years old. Well, Paul Demko, the cannabis editor at Politico, I'm going to link in the show notes. The piece is the unintended consequence of trying to give black marijuana entrepreneurs a head start. I appreciate you being so generous with your time today and uh, appreciate you coming on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And we are done for today. A preview of coming attractions by listener request. Me and Fletcher Sharp are headed down to the brand new Detroit City FC store in downtown Detroit to check out what they're up to. It's going to be a fun one when that airs. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Thanks for listening. And honestly, thank you so much for your support. Remember that you are somebody and I'll see you around Detroit. <laughs>